So with that as background, um, let's talk a little bit about AJAX, uh, which ironically stands for asynchronous JavaScript and XML, even though most AJAX calls today no longer get XML back, they get JSON back, but uh, for historical reasons. So uh, again, here, here's the, the sort of blueprint of where we're going to go. Now that we understand that there's this thing called the document object model, and that for each element on the page, there is a corresponding JavaScript object that you can manipulate, the next thing to understand is the concept of events, which are something that the browser will generate when something interesting happens. It could be that something interesting happens in the UI, like somebody clicked on something. Uh, it could be that something interesting happened on the network, like maybe an AJAX call was made and now the response has come back. Uh, so in general, it's the browser's job to make sure events are generated when interesting things happen. Your job is to decide which of those events you care about and write little pieces of JavaScript code that are often called handlers that will be bound to particular events. Right? To bind the handler means to specify the conditions under which your code should be called when the event occurs. Often, but not always, the uh, handlers are going to be bound on particular elements. So if somebody clicks that button there, or if somebody clicks any of the checkboxes in this column, uh, there are some kinds of events that are not dependent on a particular element. For example, no, uh, Call, you know, make this AJAX call to the server, but if nothing happens after five seconds, let me know so that I can show an error message. That would be an example. So, and when the timer expires, an event will be generated by the browser, and you can bind a handler to the event of the timer going off, but obviously in that case, it's not really associated with any particular element. Okay, so we have events. We have handlers which you write, and you determine which events you want the handler to be used to respond to. The handlers, when they run, can do various things, including modifying the DOM in interesting ways. Right? So they can add, change, or delete other DOM elements. They can change the page appearance. They can make calls out to the server to do more Ajaxy stuff. And then how do you test all this stuff? Because you do have to test JavaScript. Unless you're doing sort of the most trivial things, you really need to think of it as code that has to be tested separately. And just as with Ruby and Rails, we can talk about at least two sort of coarse grain levels of testing. At the unit functional level, you've got particular chunks of JavaScript that you want to make sure the right thing happens when they're called. So just as in the Rails world, we might want to ask, when this controller method is called, does it attempt to make a call to the right place in the model? Right? So you can do similar things. You can say, when a certain event is generated by the browser, does the correct handler get called? Or when this handler is called, it is supposed to make an AJAX call to the server with some information it scraped off the screen. Is it, in fact, making that AJAX call? And is it actually passing the correct parameters to the server? So just as with RSpec, you can test those things in isolation. All of the same mechanisms that RSpec uses, so the idea of setting up some preconditions, of setting up stunt doubles, so you can have canned responses to certain messages, uh, all of that stuff is available through a testing framework called Jasmine. Not, certainly not the only framework for JavaScript, but I, in my view, one of the nicer ones. And it resembles structurally. Uh, it was built to look a lot like RSpec. So if you, if you feel sort of comfortable with RSpec, it's easy to use. Also, as with Rails, you can do integration level tests. So you may have certain pages in your app that rely on JavaScript uh, or allow uh, enhanced behavior if JavaScript is turned on to do certain things. If you just add right before the first line of any scenario, if you add the string at JavaScript, then when Cucumber runs that scenario, it will actually fire up uh, what's called a headless JavaScript interpreter. That means that JavaScript is running, and it is maintaining an internal representation of the DOM just the way the browser would, but you don't actually see anything. Um, however, all of the things that JavaScript would do are going to work the same way that they would in real life. So if you uh, you know, if you have a step in your Cucumber scenario that says, uh, when I press a certain button, and if in your app's code there is a JavaScript handler bound to that button, then when you run the test, the JavaScript handler will really be called. And if that handler attempts to make changes to the DOM, those changes will be visible to Cucumber and Capybara uh, just as if it was in real life. Um, you can also, by the way, uh, if you don't want to do this, th there's another option for Cucumber, which is running it with WebDriver, which is a thing that used to be called Selenium, which actually brings up a real live browser on your screen. And you can see, like, it's like watching a ghost very quickly use the browser. Um, unless you're trying to debug something really, really evil, I find that the extra effort to get that to work is rarely worth it. Uh, but if all you're really trying to do is 
you're, re you're running a scenario and the user interface happens to depend on JavaScript to make the, the UI function correctly, you can just sort of make that part of your Cucumber scenario. Right? And I tend to use the same guidelines as I do for Rails apps, which is integration level testing is always, in some sense, more realistic because it mirrors what the user is actually doing. But when you need to sort of get into testing the less frequently visited code paths or different combinations of arguments or conditions, um, then you need the ability to, to drill down a little bit deeper and uh, do something more detailed, just as with our spec. Okay, so that's the outline. Um, and let's see how many pieces of this we can actually talk about today. So starting with manipulating the DOM, how do you manipulate it? Uh, Four-step formula. First of all, there's, if we talk about trigger elements and target elements, trigger elements are the thing that you want to detect whether something happened. So someone clicks on a button, someone fills a value in a form, someone uh, moves focus, make, moves the cursor into a particular control element. The target elements are elements that you might want to do something to as a result of the trigger. So uh, one, like a standard example for this, which you've all seen, is if you've got you know, a, a table of values and each value has a checkbox that you can select, and there's usually at the top of the column a checkbox that if you check it, it's like select all, and if you check it again, it's clear all. Right? So in that case, the trigger element is that top little checkbox. The target elements are all the checkboxes underneath, and when you're designing your page, it makes your life easier to make those elements easily selectable. Maybe you do that by giving them unique IDs, uh, or maybe in the case of the example that I just outlined where you have a bunch of little checkboxes, a really common trick is give all of the checkboxes a common CSS class. And then you can just tell jQuery, uh, for all of the things matching this CSS class, check them or uncheck them as the case may be. Then you write your JavaScript code, the handlers that actually make stuff happen by manipulating the DOM. Um, probably you'll also have a setup function because you still have to associate the handlers with the elements. And this is a place where things can get a little bit tricky because imagine, for example, that there's multiple different pages in your app where you have an element whose ID is movies table, just to pick a random example. Um, now, that's perfectly fine. As long as it only occurs in one place on any given page, it's totally legal. But remember that every page load that your app has is going to, in general, load 100% of all the JavaScript associated with the app. So, your brain wants to think in terms of this JavaScript code kind of goes with this page or this view, and this other JavaScript code goes with this other page or this view. And you can think about it like that, but all of the JavaScript code is going to be loaded on every page. So one possible way to keep this clean is you have a setup function that basically detects which page you're on, right? and you can check that because when you generate the views, each view can have a top-level ID for its entire page. And in the setup function, only if you are on the page you think you are, then you bind the handlers to things. Right? So you don't have weird surprises where uh, a handler essentially gets bound on a page that you didn't intend for it to get bound on. Here's my simplest example of putting those two things in action, which is just that I can show and hide a single element when I show and hide the checkbox. And the code that does that is, where is it? Where'd it go? There. That's it. Okay, so obviously it's in two different files. I, I put it all in a single just so that you could actually read it. Um, but here, my HTML just has these couple of elements. I have a checkbox. I have a label next to it that says show details. Um, I have this paragraph that has the text. And in the associated JavaScript file, I've got two pieces. Um, first of all, here's my single top level variable, right? So everything that I do is inside of this one. Uh, JavaScript object. The two elements of it, one of them is the simple function that actually does the thing that I just showed. Right? So when this function is called, basically, because I'm going to attach the handler to that checkbox, inside the body of the handler, this refers to the actual DOM element that received the event. Um, of course, in my case, I have wrapped the DOM element in $paren to give it the jQuery superpowers. Why? Because jQuery makes it really easy to ask a question like, if the checkbox is checked. Right? To get this same thing without the jQuery superpowers requires a little bit more convoluted and, and slightly more painful code. Um, so whenever my, function, my event handler is called, um, the thing that's going to cause the event handler to be called is activity happening on the checkbox. Therefore, I know that in the body of the handler, this refers to the checkbox. So I can ask questions about it. If the checkbox is checked, then I will 
show the, uh, I'll slide down, which is like a blind down effect. I'll show the element. Uh, if the checkbox is not checked, I will slide up, which has the effect of hiding it. And these are both jQuery calls that take parameters saying how fast you want to do it. You can also specify milliseconds or whatever. So this is the actual event handler. To make it do something, I now have to associate the handler with one or more elements. That's the binding part. And that's what I do in the setup function. So when the setup function gets called, I will uh, grab any elements matching ID equals check, which is, as you can see, it's only the checkbox that matches that. And I'm going to register whenever it, there's a state change, I will call this function. Right, so that's the binding piece. Um, I could also have said when it's clicked, uh, but state change is a little bit more general because state change includes everything from like, you know, the user clicks, holds down the mouse button, and then releases. Um, and that whole thing generates a state change event. So basically, I'm saying whenever the checkbox changes state in any way, call the function. And then inside the function, I can check which state did we just change to and do the appropriate thing. So the only thing that's left is somewhere I have to actually call the setup function, right? And that's, that's the last line, which was hidden. So um, when, oops, at the top of my HTML, I actually load this, this file called example.js. That's the file that contains all this stuff. It, should, it lives in a separate file. So most of this file is just defining this variable, right? There's no, nothing is actually happening here. I'm just sort of defining this object that has two function valued properties. And then after I do that, I call the setup function. So base, and uh, remember that when I pass a function valued object to dollar, what that means is add this function to the list of things to run once the page is loaded. Okay, so one more time, what's the entire flow of control here? The page begins to get loaded. As the page begins to get loaded, one of the very first lines in the page, well, the very first line uh, in the head is to load jQuery, because without jQuery, uh, the superpower stuff wouldn't work. And then load my little example.js file. Now, at this point, it is not predictable whether the rest of this stuff will be loaded first or whether example.js will be loaded first, which is why the idea of a ready function is so important. So let's assume for the sake of argument that uh, immediately the browser goes out and starts fetching example.js. It loads it, and the last thing in example.js says, add this setup function to the list of things to do as soon as the page is finished loading. Okay, so sometime later the page finishes loading, the setup function is called, and then that causes any state change on this checkbox to call this function. And you know, the result is the uh, incredibly interesting behavior. Right? Not much going on there, but it gives you the idea of how the moving parts work together, I hope. The one step that I sort of conveniently left out is if we're following the TDD religion, then actually, before we write the handler functions, we should think about writing a test that would check if the right thing happened. Right? So again, that example is really, really simple. It might be overkill to write a test for it. But you can imagine, if you think about how would you test that, the thing you're trying to test is when somebody uh, clicks on the checkbox, when it, when it uh, changes state, and therefore the browser is supposed to generate the event, then if it's changing state from not checked to checked, then the text should appear. And if it's vice versa, then the text should disappear. So in a few more slides, I'll show you exactly how you can capture that behavior in a test using Jasmine, uh, which looks a whole lot like our spec. Okay, so there's that.